I'm Julie Zenner, and here's what you'll see next on Almanac North. We continue our special series, Lessons from COVID-19, with a look at how the Boys Ford Band of Chippewa has navigated the pandemic. The Duluth Superior Symphony Orchestra has found new ways to connect with its audience despite the constraints of COVID-19. And Iron Range school leaders talk about how things are going with students back in the classroom. These topics and Voices of the Region, next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. Dennis is off this week as we alternate hosting during the pandemic. Well, reaction has been swift to the shooting of Dante Wright at the hands of police in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. Protesters took to the streets in Duluth Wednesday, marching from the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial to City Hall. The Duluth branch of the NAACP and Duluth Human Rights Commission members called for action to end race-based discrimination by police. We're planning more coverage on this developing story next week. Wisconsin Governor Tony Evers announced a $100 million investment in the state's economic recovery this week. Half of that funding will go to Main Street bounce back grants to encourage businesses to move into vacant storefronts in Wisconsin towns. In total, the state is expecting to receive more than $3 billion from the federal government to assist in recovery from the pandemic. The City of Superior is continuing efforts to bring affordable high-speed internet to the community. The City held its first Connect Superior listening session Thursday as it works to build broadband infrastructure. Superior leaders say the pandemic has shown the need for a more affordable, accessible high-speed network in the City. Duluth, Denfeld and Duluth East High School seniors may graduate in person ceremonies this spring with adjustments for COVID. An outdoor all class ceremony could be held at public school stadium for Denfeld and East is considering indoor ceremonies at Amsoil Arena. While planning for graduation continues, the school district announced that one rite of passage, the senior prom will not be held due to COVID. Well, this week we continue our special series, Lessons from COVID-19, as we explore one Minnesota tribe's response to the pandemic. We sat down with Boys Fort Band Chair Kathy Chavers, who is also the first female president of Minnesota's Chippewa tribe. We asked her how the pandemic has affected day-to-day -day business on the reservation and what changes they have made. I've heard that this was, uh, this was inevitable to come. I would never in my lifetime have thought that this pandemic would be here, um, but it's here. We started first hearing about the virus, of course, like everybody else. And so we started having tribal emergency response committee meetings as part of our emergency preparedness plan. We had uh, uh, daily meetings with our Turk committee. We call it our Turk committee and uh, implementing uh, items of what do we need to do. Uh, we know we're gonna need masks, we know we're gonna need hand sanitizer, all the things that are, are part of the pandemic as normal now. We limited our travel, we set up a red zone within Boys Fort where we, wouldn't, uh, uh, we didn't want people traveling outside this area. If they did travel, they had to uh, isolate for two weeks. Um, and then we started getting you know, temperature checks. We're trying to get the equipment for our clinics. We have clinics in both Net Lake and Vermilion. Uh, we were trying to get tests here, working with the state, working with the IHS. So a lot of, uh, a lot of work was uh, initiated through our Turk committee with all the members of our uh, emergency response planning committee together. Well, then um, eventually we ended up uh, wondering basically how we were going to get this information out to our people. We have approximately four to 500 residents here at um, uh, Net Lake. In Vermilion, we have approximately four to 500 there. We know we have at least uh, 200 to 400 band members in the Duluth area, and we know we have at least uh, probably a thousand tribal members in the Minneapolis area, but we know we have about 2,000 people in Minnesota. We also have our total band membership of 3,500 plus. And so we decided to do a video, and we did a video then uh, basically, yeah. uh, we were trying to do a video oh, once a week. By using the videos, we were accessing not only uh, people that were more tech savvy, 
Buffalo. Uh, but also those in the Virginia area, Eveleth, Minneapolis, or anywhere across the United States. We utilize YouTube, and also then we put it on our boysfort.com website. And then we have our Facebook page. So uh, social media was a way to also get it out. We get our, uh, our vaccines from Indian Health Service. And Indian Health Service gives us uh, 100, uh, was started out with 100 vaccines per site. We started vaccinating our elderly, our chronically ill, and then even our fluent speakers, because our fluent speakers, we only have five left. And so we put them as high priority. Senator Tina Smith took time out of her busy schedule to come over to our Minneapolis uh, vaccination clinic. And she was very impressed and so appreciative of what the tribes have done with regards to getting these vaccines out. We didn't vaccinate just our band members. We vaccinated family members, whether they were band members. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because we need to vaccinate as many people as possible. And I'm not trying to be um, disrespectful here, but tribes are doing a much better job than the state with regards to vaccinating people. Um, because we know what to do with limited resources. We know how to access uh, different ways and, and ideas. And just because of the limited funding we've been getting for many years from the federal government. So we, we know how to do that. The bad thing about this virus is it did, it is causing a lot of havoc and, and there's no more normal. But one of the thing, good things that did come out of it is the technology. Technology came to the forefront for everybody. So these rural areas and these tribes and these reservations that are suffering from lack of broadband or lack of internet access, that stuff came to the forefront. And so we were running into difficulties with that, especially when it came to which employees were going to work in the office and which employees were going to work from home. But then we were also looking with employees with their chronic health conditions. How can we set them up? Um, and so that, that posed a, a difficult challenge for us here at Boys Fort. Uh, but we managed with hotspots, what have you. It's affected each tribe differently. Um, for example, the tribal leaders right away having uh, daily calls because we wanted to share resources, stories, what was working, what wasn't working, what are you doing, uh, we're doing this. Um, then it got to where we included the state people. Then it got to where we included the federal people also wanted to be involved. So to keep that network open from federal, state to tribe. I think a lot of us have been impacted differently, uh, but we're all utilizing resources amongst us to help us through those times of need. Our tradition and our culture are pulling us through this. Next week, our special series continues with an interview with well-known musician and disability activist Galen Lee. Galen spoke about her fears that persons with disabilities would not receive the same medical care as others during the pandemic. This was the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, right in the middle of the pandemic in July. And it was sort of a, it was like a Twilight Zone episode, you know, like everybody that I knew with disabilities was very, very locked down and really trying to stay safe, but more at risk. Earlier in the pandemic, hospitals were starting to create emergency policies for if they needed to ration things like ventilators. And some of these policies were being written where they would prioritize people without health conditions and not prioritize people who had pre-existing health issues or disabilities. The problem with that issue is that if you are rationing medical, um, necessary medical devices for recovery and a doctor looks at someone like me or someone else with a disability, um, they're coming at it with their own preconceived notions of like what kind of life mine is. We'll have more with Galen Lee and how she has coped through the pandemic next week on Almanac North.
Toulouse Superior Symphony Orchestra has continued to make beautiful music despite the pandemic. The DSSO pivoted to live stream its performances to viewers at home when COVID-19 struck, and it became the first orchestra in Minnesota to perform to a limited live audience earlier this year. Here to tell us how they did it is Brandon Van Weyenberg, Executive Director of the DSSO. And welcome, Brandon. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Uh, as we mentioned, the DSSO was the first local arts organization to bring back live performances. How was that decision made? It had to be a difficult one. It really was a difficult one. So we talked with our uh, with our musicians to try and figure out exactly what type of protocols uh, both nationally and then locally that we could abide by to make that happen. We talked to our music director Director Dirk Meyer to see what type of programming. You know, programming for a 72 piece uh, orchestra is great, but now limiting it to 35, um, the possibilities are a little small. Um, so we, we worked, and we worked with the deck to make sure we had the health protocols in place, uh, the new HEPA filters, uh, filtration systems, air recirculation, uh, just to make, make sure it happened. And just lined up where we were seeing some really good partnerships develop, especially the one with WDSE to actually make the live stream happen. And then over the summer, we just made the decision that I think everything, uh, everything's going to work out. So let's go, at, go forward with uh, making music uh, first live stream and then when the health protocol said we can't allow live, live audiences, we made the decision to invite people back into the hall. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that there are fewer musicians <laughs> playing at one time, that you almost have to cut the, the number of musicians performing in half. How is that for them? Because it, it has to be you know, so different from being right next to <laughs> your fellow musicians and having all of that sound around you. It's really odd looking out on stage and seeing the stand partners that you're used to seeing just, mm -hmm. just split apart and pushed apart. Um, uh, you, you're seeing on stage right now, uh, musicians are about six feet apart and usually violin stand partners are close together uh, making music. Um, with talking to the musicians, what they're missing is, is being able to come together in one force. Uh, they understand that the limits we have to have are for the health and safety of our community and for them, um, and you know, I, I'm very much looking forward to the, uh, the place in the fall we can come back with less distance and come together. Mm -hmm. And uh, a limited audience as well. How many people are you able to have in the audience, and how to? How do the lucky ones get chosen? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, with the new orders that sort of happened in, on April 1st, we can have up to 487 people in the hall, which usually fits 2,200 people, um, uh, do, with six feet distance around them. Uh, we prioritize subscribers, but we were also, uh, since the, uh, February, allowed uh, single ticket buyers to come in uh, for $20 each, uh, which is much less than the, what they normally would during the year, because we can't guarantee an exact seat. So we have to go and, and everyone is screened a week, uh, week before, called, make sure they have all their COVID uh, tests are done, and um, just make sure that they're healthy and come in and enjoy a concert. No walk-ups right now, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And, and as we mentioned, there was that decision to live stream performances mm -hmm. during the pandemic. How is that working out for you? Right now we are seeing a great growth. We have 60% of our uh, live stream audience is actually here in the Duluth Superior area. 16% are coming from the Twin Cities and the remainder is coming up from I'm very happy to say 33 different states here. Uh, I told, was talking to you earlier, my mom is now able to watch from Indiana. <laughs> uh, and a lot of other, other people who, uh, who love this orchestra are actually able to watch uh, in real time or on demand the orchestra that they know and love, maybe from Florida or Arizona. And how does it work? Do they, do they have to purchase tickets uh, so that they have access or yep, can they uh, just go on? Yep, uh, pr uh, purchase tickets, $10 for one of the live shows. So tomorrow night, it starts at seven o'clock, $10 on DSSO.com. If you don't have an account, you just make, an, a, make a, a free account uh, with your name, uh, email address, uh, and zip code. Pay the ten dollars, and you'll have access to the live stream concert for both this this concert as well as the, as well as the May eighth, and then uh, you'll be able to watch it on demand for two weeks after it. This seems like a good segue to uh, <laughs> promote this week's concert. Yes, this week's concert is Mendelssohn and Price. So uh, the Price is a wonderful concerto uh, performed by Clayton Stevenson, this great young artist. Uh, he actually learned this concerto just for us. Uh, and Price was the first African-American, very well-known composer. And this is her, you know, her first and only piano concerto. It's this wonderful work that's been rediscovered the last few years. And so that'll be a Duluth uh, premiere for us to be able to perform it. And then Mendelssohn's uh, Fourth Symphony, The Italian, will cap it off. Mm -hmm. And are there um, 
performance notes available online so that people can follow along and know Perform what oh yeah performance notes you'll be able to actually uh, what I do uh, it, while I'm live streaming it, I'll, I'll watch it in the uh, second screen or my phone I'll read the program notes uh, also available like while you're live streaming it uh, in a beautiful uh, PDF format mm -hmm. now you've been with the DSSO for a little more than a year and a half mm -hmm. about that that has to be a really strange time to come in and try to, to make a cohesive uh, organization. Um, yeah, it's, it's been different because most mm -hmm. of my tenure has been under uh, the COVID umbrella. Mm -hmm. uh, but I came to this organization uh, to really help them uh, uh, just grow and I, I can have very happy to say this organization has grown by leaps and bounds uh, th through not only through COVID, but what we were able to do and accomplish on the financial side and the fiscal side. Uh, we've been able to create a financially stable organization. Uh, we've been able to grow uh, donors. We've been able to grow our youth orchestra. This year's youth orchestra has been gone all digital. No, mm -hmm. One of the youth orchestra people have seen each other um, in over a year. Uh, we have over 100 students who are dialing in on Monday nights for their Zoom sessions, uh, and they're putting together Together, some really great pieces and work and even even a composition talking about their experience as musicians during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Only about 15 seconds or so left but um, <laughs> any anything coming out of this experience that you think is going to carry forward even after the pandemic? Definitely for us music selection. You know, talking about uh, what music we, we perform, why we perform it, uh, expanding the knowledge of what music is to our students who, uh, who are in the youth orchestra, but also to our audiences and making really good informed selections uh, of different new music. All right, Brandon Van Weyenberg, Executive Director of the Duluth Superior Symphony Orchestra, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Good luck with the concert this weekend. It's time now for our Voices of the Region segment where we ask a Northland journalist about the stories they're following. This week we talked with Marshall Helmberger, the editor of the Timber Jay based in Tower, Minnesota. We are covering Eagles Nest Township, which is located between Tower and Ely. Uh, the town board in Eagles Nest Township is supposed to decide this coming Tuesday whether to take possession of a small portion of land dedicated to the public in 1928 to build a public access point to Eagles Nest Lake 1, which currently has no public access. The lake has a large number of summer cabins and residents there have been successful in heading off creation of a public access to the lake in the past. Now the township's fire department say they want the road as a water source, which is conveniently located across the road from the fire department. But the road, if it's built, will potentially provide access to several hundred feet of shoreline in addition that this small, nearly century old plat had also dedicated to public use. It creates a really odd situation, which I haven't seen up here before, where lake cabin owners don't actually own their lake frontage, but most have used it as if it is their own, even though they aren't paying taxes on it. Now with the prospect that their front yards, which had long been private, could be opened up to public use, they're pretty unhappy about the loss of privacy. We have a story on the Environmental Protection Agency, which has disapproved a portion of the state of Minnesota's impaired waters list because the MPCA, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, failed to list wild rice waters that have been impacted by sulfate pollution, mostly from mining discharges. The impaired waters list is updated every two years and under the Clean Water Act, the state must not only list waters affected in some way by pollution, but provide a plan for improving their water quality. Tribes in northern Minnesota and environmental groups have been calling for the MPCA to list wild rice waters impaired by sulfates uh, for, for years, and uh, the MPCA has, has not done that. 
the MPCA has refused to list wild rice waters, uh, arguing that the legislature has prohibited them from regulating industries that discharge sulfates. And the legislature has tried to do that, uh, but the EPA, in a March 26 letter to the uh, MPCA, said that the MPCA's refusal to regulate uh, these waters uh, and these industries that are causing the pollution appears to violate the Clean Water Act. So in response, the federal agency said they'll be providing the MPCA with their own list of impaired wild rice waters by the end of April. And presumably the MPCA will then need to come up with a plan uh, to reduce sulfate pollution, which has proven to be a major challenge. The mining industry has pulled out all the stops, both politically and legally in recent years, to head off any regulation of sulfates. So this is gonna be an interesting one to watch as it plays out. Well, we have two stories that actually speak to the decline in so many traditional organizations. That's something that we've certainly seen uh, all across the country. And locally here, west of Cook, the organizers of the Bear River Fair have announced that that more than century old regional fair will be lost to history if no new organizers agree to take up the task of putting on the fair. The members of the organizing committee are mostly in their 80s and they say they don't have the energy to do it anymore. Uh, previous efforts to recruit younger members to the organization have mostly failed. Uh, so the fair may be done as a community event. At the same time, now here in Tower, uh, we're reporting on the American Legion Post 245, a longtime fixture in the community, which surrendered its charter recently. Uh, while the Post still had a few dozen members on the books, they were down to just three uh, active members, the youngest of whom was 88. Uh, so for years, the Post members were very active in the community. They organized events, they raised money for local school activities, sports teams, and other things. Uh, they provided the color guard at the annual 4th of July parades, at Veterans and Memorial Day services, and they were just generally there to help anyone who needed it. I mean, it's a really good bunch of people. Um, their pancake breakfasts were a long time Sunday morning fixture in Tower, which attracted hundreds of people uh, some mornings, and that helped them raise money for their various community efforts. You know, the loss of uh, post 220, 245 is hardly an exception. Here in Minnesota, the American Legion once had 137,000 members, but now their total membership has fallen to 64,000 statewide. And if the post and tower is any indication, many of those remaining members may not be actively involved in their posts. Students returned to the classroom earlier this year in many northern Minnesota school districts. It marked a turning point in the battle against the pandemic and a sign of brighter days ahead. On Thursday, school officials in Itasca County had an update on the return to the classroom instruction. Currently, we are in an in-person K-12 setting. Um, all our students have been in person basically since February 8th. Um, we've been very diligent within our school district. Um, to make sure that we've had in-person learning. Our compliance as far as overall masking, um, limited movement, and, and maintaining the social distancing within our classrooms, whether it be six foot, six foot or three feet, have been able to make us very successful in this in-person effort as we have only lost 13 school days to in-person learning. We're continually asking our parents to be compliant. Um, along with our students within the school buildings. Parents, if you have students that have symptoms, please keep them home. If you have a pending test within your home, please keep all your students home and do not send them to school. We're um, moving into spring sports and planning for concerts, prom and graduation. And those are proceeding, putting precautions in place with some modifications. And uh, we're optimistic that we can have some version of those. Uh, we also have uh, had the opportunity for students 16 and plus to, to begin receiving the Pfizer vaccination. We'll actually have a couple of students on Friday receive their second dose and be fully vaccinated. As far as we're aware, there are about 10% of our students that are eligible 16 plus that have now begun the vaccination process. So 
a um, lot of room to grow there, and we're uh, hopeful that that you know, trend goes in the right direction. We continue to hear how grateful people are that uh, as a system, we've been able to be in person for most of the year like Greenway. It's been a lot of work and been challenging, but uh, just something we prioritized. We're also hearing that you know the quarantines that are that my peers have mentioned have been challenging for families and uh, there's frustration building it seems now around that and around masking and uh, you know I just want to let folks know that we're doing our best to keep our learning environment safe and uh, following the rules that we need to follow that's sort of the trade-off of being in person that there's tighter restrictions and if we want to be in person there's some consequences to that too. Our kids are awesome and they're in many cases way more resilient than we tend to be as adults. Uh, if you come to one of our schools, uh, any, you know, any of the schools that are on the call today, I think you'll see kids doing school with masks and in many cases just have adjusted to a new normal. And absolutely, we're all looking forward to the day when masks aren't part of that, but our kids have just made that adjustment and they're happy to be around their friends. And uh, we're also seeing evidence that there's a great deal of learning going on. The discussion with school superintendents was part of a virtual media briefing with the Itasca County Health Department. Well, that's our time this week, but you can stay up to date with Almanac North by following us on social media. You'll find us on Facebook and Twitter, and you can also visit the WDSE website for program updates and news about your favorite PBS programs. And take public television with you wherever you go by downloading the PBS video app on your phone or tablet. Thanks to our guests and to the crew here in the studio. I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.